For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Let's talk about mutation rates. Now there are many different types of mutation rates. There is the phylogenetic method, which is the non-observed mutation rate. This is based on evolutionary assumptions, so we are not going to focus on this method we want to look at the observed mutation rates because that is what real science deals with. Observation that is testable and repeatable. Therefore, we will be looking at both the de novo mutation rate, which deals with the mutation accumulation over time while ignoring somatic mutations. Then we will look at substitution rates because they also deal with mutations in a population size. But now, let's begin with this de novo mutation rate, since it's a great place to start and involves the entire population as well. So, how can this disprove evolution? Easy. This is done by looking at the mutation accumulation. You see, each generation passes on a certain amount of new mutations that selection cannot see. Selection can only remove the worst and most detrimental mutations, or else it would select away healthy cells that might have slight mutations in them. Obviously that can't happen. So what does happen? Well, in 2016, Dan Grauer noticed and stated, each newborn carries 53 to 103 point mutations that are not found in either of the two parental genomes. If 80% of the genome is functional, as trumped by the ENCODE Project Consortium of 2012, then 45 to 82 deleterious mutations arise per generation. Now let's look at experiments to see if that is the case worldwide. What do we see? Well, no matter where we look, the accumulation of harmful mutations are building up and up and up, and nothing can stop the process. Now, here's the problem with that. At first, it was assumed by evolutionists that junk DNA was 99% useless trash with no function at all, hence why they called it junk DNA. They said that all this junk DNA is the leftover remnants of the defective mutation accumulation that has been building up over deep evolutionary time. This is why Dan Grauer said, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong, because, as stated by them, if the human genome is indeed devoid of junk DNA, as implied by the ENCODE project, then a long, undirected evolutionary process cannot explain the human genome. Now here's the scenario played out for you. Let's use 80 as the average number of mutations children will inherit. Now let's use Adam as the first generation, who had no mutations. Now his first children would have anywhere from 60 to 100 new mutations. But let's give evolution the benefit of the doubt on this one, and in this scenario say that the perfect selection can see and remove all of the worst mutations. But it still leaves the best of the worst, leaving 60 new mutations to be passed on to the next generation. Then this process repeats to the next generation, and then the next generation. As you can see, the doubling of each generation keeps occurring. This is what scientists have observed and how some mutation rates are actually counted. But this should be not taking place over deep evolutionary time and why there are so many theories trying to explain away the data. Because if you rewind the mutational clock, what do you see? Well, 
you find not many mutations had accumulated in humanity the farther you go back in time. The matter of fact, if you lay down side by side ancient man next to modern day man, ancient man had fewer mutations. This de novo mutation accumulation evidence points to the human genome being very young and starting off perfect and going in decline, the exact opposite of what evolution teaches. Also, there are not enough total accumulated mutations if evolution was true. And no matter where you test in the mitochondria, we find mutation accumulation only goes back about 6,000 to 6,500 years. We can also look at substitution rates because those are easier to count. Evolutionists looked in the human genome and discovered that all of humanity only has 24 fixed substitution differences between them. Because they believed in evolution, they made a prediction based on this new evidence. Back in the 90s, when they discovered this, they believed that the last bottleneck was 133,000 years ago. So based on this assumption, they assumed that one substitution must occur every 12,000 years if evolution is true, or one mutation every 300 to 600 generations. What did they discover? We discovered that there's one substitution every 33 generations, again going back only about 6,500 years. So now ask yourself, why is it that when testing the entire mitochondria, or any of the 37 individual genes in the mitochondria, or individual sections of the mitochondria like the D-loop region or the CO1 fragment, or even when counting substitution rates, no matter where you look or what you test, they all give the same results. All they are left with now is inventing their own models and pathetic rescuing devices to fight against the new observable evidence. Now, here's another thing. We, Young Earth Creationists, are the only ones making testable predictions on mutation rates. You see, evolutionists cannot do this because they do not agree with the observable empirical rate. Here's where Dr. Jensen actually posts a challenge to any evolutionist to make a prediction against him. Guess what? None have. I'm taking the challenge to them now and saying, Hey, let's go out and there's a, there's a fox in the woods. I bet you I can tell you how fast his mutation rate is. I have even recently used the empirical rate to make a prediction. It's called the de novo mutation rate validates the antediluvian patriarchs. So what I did was take the most accurate mutation rate study to date, which is Kong in 2015, who shows that by age 25, a male passes on 51 new mutations to their offspring, and females pass on 11. Every year the parents age, they build up new mutations that get passed on. For males, it's 2.01 new mutations per year, and for females, it's 0.83. So what I did is I took this, and then I lined it up with the Bible, and what it says about the ancient biblical patriarchs. Since the Bible is specific about the ages that the people were when they had kids, then I was able to calculate out and determine if the antediluvian patriarchs were real people and if their extreme ages were actually true. Guess what? The numbers lined up perfectly. And it's this study that I have submitted to peer review. Before we move on, let me explain what fixation means, because you will need to know to understand this in regards to substitution differences. Look at these two pyramids. At the base of these pyramids, you see two different populations of people. The top of the pyramid is going to represent fixation. That is, when a new mutation arises and makes its way through the population, generation after generation, until this new mutation becomes fixed in that population. Meaning, everyone now has this new mutation. It has become a fixed substitution. Now, let's say a person in a tribe has a new mutation arise. Well, depending on the population of the tribe this person lives in, it will determine the time that it takes for that population to reach fixation of this new mutation. Look at this chart. The top represents the Asian haplogroups. Looking specifically at haplogroup Q, 
we can see the migration taken all the way from Asia over to North America and then down to South America. Now here's what proves fixation rates are based on population size and not deep time. We know that South America was inhabited at the same time via migration from the north. Well, when we look at these branches, what do we see? We see more differences in some and less differences in others. Well, how could this be if they all arrived at the same time? Easy. The long branches are smaller populations. You can see that they have far more differences because they have more fixations compared to, say, the Aztecs and Mayans, which have much fewer fixed mutation differences represented by the shorter branches. So, a quick recap. What determines the fixation rate of those substitutions are the population size. Since we see an average substitution rate occurring about every 30 to 44 generations, then it doesn't take very long to get 24 fixed substitution in the world's population, especially since there were two bottlenecks in the past, being the flood bottleneck and creation. And humans, living in smaller tribal populations over longer periods of time, allow for faster fixations of these substitutions. This explains why there are so few fixed substitutions, because humanity is young. And it also explains why Africa has the most diversity when it comes to fixed substitutions, because they have lived in smaller tribal populations and also have younger birth rates. Now, let's go over one more time why the best mutation rate is that of substitutions. Like de novo mutation accumulation, it also shows the mutation rate in populations, not just individuals like somatic mutations do. Somatic mutations can build up in your lifetime more than they build up in someone else's. Let's just say, for instance, you had a twin brother, and your twin brother was an alcoholic he's going to accumulate more mutations than you will. But those mutations might not get passed on to the next generation. That's why somatic mutation rates aren't accurate, where substitution rates are accurate. So when testing a group of people, we can find how often an allele can change in that population. And when testing a large, diverse group of people, it can show an overall substitution rate. So basically, overall, it shows how often a substitution mutation occurs in that population. And this is where evolution is falsified. You see, for evolution to be true regarding substitutions, they need a much slower rate of mutations than we actually observe. They cannot slow this rate down using any known natural mechanism. So they have to invoke crazy rescue devices, such as maybe genetic drift removed some of these mutations, or maybe even natural selection was way stronger in the past and able to remove these mutations so that we don't see them today. All of these horrible hypotheticals are nothing more than an ad hoc rescue device to fight against the observable data that tells us that humanity is young. You see, since humans on average are only about 8 substitution differences with a maximum of 24, we should expect a fast mutation rate. And that is exactly what we see. We see a fairly constant rate of substitutions occurring in the mitochondria, and when we place this rate up next to the young earth timeline, the numbers fit perfectly, with humanity only having a maximum of 24 fixed substitution differences. We can easily explain this by the fast fixation rates in the past, because humanity lived in smaller populations. Evolution cannot explain this, because their model has multiple worldwide bottlenecks occurring with small populations over many thousands upon thousands of years. The numbers just don't add up, and their model is easily falsified using this observable fast mutation rates and observing how few total fixed substitutions there actually are. Some alleles are spelled in a way that retains the original instruction of the gene. Other alleles contain changes to the sequence of letters, sometimes called DNA mutations, that change the meaning. Letters may be left out, repeated, or changed completely. 
even a single letter change can have a big impact on the instructions that your body has. The instructions contained in some genes are so important that there are very few alleles or alternate spellings in the population. Significant changes in these genes are often linked to disease. But if that's not destructive enough, evolution has been dealt its death blow as they have discovered that mutations are all new. Gene mutations only began showing up in the last 200 to 400 generations, which take us back right to the beginning of creation. Exactly what our model predicted.